Adams? Security in Adams Town is on a couple of our buildings after being set on fire apparently. Okay, what part of Adams Town is it in? Uh, the building site's parked under construction at the moment. It's early morning in West Dublin. Multiple crews are responding to reports of an explosion ripping through a row of terrace houses in a ghost estate. Worryingly, there are also reports of missing teenagers in the area. Acting District Officer Peter Navin's first priority is to get an immediate update from Station Officer James Hetherington. James, how are you? That's going to whip right along that roof. We ain't going to yeah. stop that. Two lines of 45 mm down to the front. And I've been making it on the second line around the back to the other side of it. The side wall around here. Yeah, see, you can see the top. Yeah. It's starting to fall, so no one to go to the other end of it. Yeah, right. Firebreak seems to be holding it there at that. But if it goes, if it goes into the next one. Ghost estates pose many problems for us. Obviously there's vandalism and so on because they're left derelict. They're generally quite isolated. Many of these are built in the middle of fields in areas where there's no uh, ancillary supplies put in yet. Each fire engine would carry 1,800 litres of water, but you quite rapidly need to get water from the hydrants in the ground. In this instance, that wasn't available. Oh, we lost all our pressure. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll set up around the back here. The roof is still intact. It's just waiting for water. Uh, that fire break seems to be holding from going into the next section at the moment. As soon as we get water, we can proceed. Backup soon arrives in the form of one of the three Dublin Fire Brigade water tankers. Each of these appliances carries an additional 19,000 litres of water, supplying much needed support to the crews on the ground. You are now safety officer over there, right? Okay. The timber frame construction, you can see the walls are bulging on all sides. We've already had partial collapses. We've had no water to it, we're literally only getting water to it now. So I want you to go over, set yourself up where you can see both sides. We're going to have water back on that line in two minutes, lads. What's posing a real problem for firefighting is timber frame construction. You know, the house was well alight by the time we got there because they do rapidly spread. In a timber frame house, the actual timber construction, everything is supported from that a brick facade on the front of the house. It's actually not a supporting brick wall. It's just tied into a timber frame. So when the timber behind that burns away, that becomes a real danger for firefighters because those walls can collapse forward. And we've had several occasions of that uh, in, in recent years. The other thing, just to make the lads aware that uh, guards around us with two 14-year-old girls missing from the Adamstown area. It's a temporary mall just to facilitate a quick search. It will be common enough when we go to a derelict site where there will be reports of people that normally reside there or hang around there or, or you know, our kids have been seen there earlier. So we have to follow that up. So in this case, you know, we needed to get water as quick as we could in order to extinguish the fire to get in there to, to search. Thankfully, it's very rare that, you know, anybody is actually in there. They're normally well gone at that stage. With the fire all but extinguished, 3rd Officer Jerry Stanley and Acting DO Peter Navin oversee the final stages of the operation. Once we had water, the fire was quite quickly contained. At the moment we have the lads in there now, knocking down the last few final pockets. I'd say we'll be calling in a demolition crew early in the morning. We have dangerous building inspectors on the way. The section that's burnt will have to come down. So it's completely unstable. There was concerns for some missing teenagers in the area. So when we got it knocked down, we had a quick scout around inside, and we're happy that the building is clear. Station Officer Derek McGuinness is on his way to meet Plan Ireland CEO David Dalton. Derek is amongst a group of Irish firefighters on a mission to Niger in West Africa. The aim is to deliver two badly needed fire appliances and an ambulance. They have a long road ahead of them. The first part of the journey is, is coming right across Benin. Um, so that's over 700 kilometres to bring you to the border to Gaia. Then we drive on another three or 400 kilometres to Zinder, which is two and a half times the size of Ireland, the province. 
there is only one fire engine at the moment, you know, so it's fantastic that we're able to go out and double yes, the yeah. number of, of fire engines. There's very few girls in secondary schools, you'll see life there is very difficult for girls. Well, that's what we were told. I mean, the benefit of the fire blinds is it's twofold. It's really firefighting and rescue. Yeah. And as well as that, to, to try and educate the girls, carrying water um, to the villages. Instead of them doing it all day, we can get a fire blinds. But if they're not spending two hours each yeah, way, yeah. collecting uh, the, the water, uh, it'll free them up to go to school and get a good education. For any day. Just to, yeah, absolutely. All the rest of the Having collected the two trucks donated from Monaghan Fire Brigade and an ambulance donated from Cork, Derek and the crew of Irish firefighters set out from the port city of Contenu on their arduous 1600 kilometre journey to the impoverished desert city of Zinder. So it's going to be a long day. We finished about midnight last night. We wasted so much time yesterday trying to get the vehicles out of the docks that were way behind. So we're leaving at 5 o'clock now and we're heading for Goya. We're making good ground, we're nearly three and a half hours on the road now. We were driving in a lot of fog earlier this morning there, but the sun is starting to come out now and it's going to burn it off, so we'll make up more ground. We have a breakdown in the way to Zinder. We're just waiting now on the other team for to come back uh, so they can assist us in making repairs. It's extremely warm. It says we're all very tired now at this stage. A really long day yesterday. It's 16 and a half hours, more or less flat out. It's about half seven in the morning. Just get motored and again. We've about somewhere in the region of 500 kilometres to do today. But the first 100 kilometres of that are really just craters. The, the, the city here, this town, is just unbelievable. Just two, three foot deep craters. It's never saw the It's very hot in the engine. There's no air conditioning here. The heat is absolutely tremendous. As you can see, we're really going nowhere for the next 70 kilometres until we get to Tarmac. Yeah, I've never witnessed the like of it. We couldn't actually touch the gear stick, it was that hot. When you're in 40 plus degrees, it's actually warmer in the appliance than it is outside with the engine heat coming up through the, through the cab. So that was one of the aspects we hadn't really planned for. trucks were not built for long distance driving, yet slowly but surely they're getting there. Home is thousands of kilometres away, but in every town they pass through, this unlikely Irish convoy attracts curiosity and wonder. The poverty that's over there, it's hardship and your heart would go out to them. It really needs irrigation, it needs education, not just from what we're doing, they need really education from a farming point of view. If you can educate the people how to manage their own crops, that would go a huge way. Start of day five, six o'clock in the morning. We rolled in here about quarter past one this morning. No running water, we're covered in dust from the sandstar. Can't shower. So we just uh, can't wait to get this in there. And have a shower, hopefully. <coughs> Sorry, so 600 kilometers, and uh, we'll see how we go. Dublin Fire Brigade's training centre, cool heads will be required as the latest batch of recruits are about to experience their first up-close and personal encounter with the heavy heat from a live fire. Course Director Rob Tierney is keeping a close eye on preparations. What we're going to simulate here today is get the crew firefighters used to heat. So we have a detached burn box here uh, attached to a metal container here. So they'll be going from the top downward with a task towards the burn box itself. That's the way to build up to dealing with the flames. We want to get them used to heat first. It's just managing their own bodies, managing their breathing apparatus, sticking to procedures, and actually completing the task that's been designated for them. For these recruits, today's session is truly a baptism of fire. 
The trainees will be split into groups of two, each team having one goal, to locate and remove a casualty. Okay, Team Alpha, Wilson and Fergs, and Team Bravo, Mulher, Mulher, be prepared. Team Alpha, are you ready? Easy, all right, let's go. One hand search, down two levels, two sets of stairs, as quick as you can. Hands on the ground floor. All right, let's go, come on. Come on, let's go. It will be the recruits' toughest challenge yet, searching in complete darkness in sweltering 150 degree heat, and the truest indicator of whether they have what it takes to become firefighters. One of the toughest days and one that will stand out in my memory for a long time. Within seconds of entering into it, you feel, no, there's no way you can complete this, but you know you have to keep on going forward. Left hand stairs, down two levels, consistent two flights of stairs, search as quick as you can, casualties are on the ground floor. Basement level. The heat was at that stage like nothing we had experienced, definitely. It was much hotter, much more physically demanding. Side walls are hot, the floors are hot, the handles are hot now. I mean, proper hot, like, it'd be smoke filled, you see nothing, there's a lot of hatches, there's trips, falls, hazards. You burn up some amount of fluids, very easy to dehydrate, like, again, can you keep your concentration? Can you do all your safety procedures, do all your surface procedures? Come over here, come out, one under here. It's mentally and physically does zap you. We went down to the end of the firebox. We stared. We went down two levels behind the stairs on the firebox. We found one casualty. By the time you try and lift even a dummy that weighs only 30 or 40 kilograms, you feel as if you don't have an ounce of energy left in your body. You feel as if you're burning from the inside out. You're literally cooking within your suit. And at that stage, you're on your hands and knees. You can't go any further. Right, get under there, need a team quick. Let's go, let's go, let's go. We've a casualty in there and he's rescuing off. After the first time you, you come out, within a few minutes you're going back in for your second wear. But this is all part of your training and you have to just get on with it and you do what you have to do and that's it. Disorientated and bathed in sweat, recruits Mulhern and Malarvey have returned empty handed. They now have to recount what happened to the entry control officer. Right, tell the ESO what you're seeing. Yeah. Team Alpha. Yeah, we went down two stairs. Uh, sorry, we, we were on the left and we, we followed the wall to, to, to the to the right. There was a turn to the right. That there was saying? a turn to the right, uh, just near enough to where the fire was. So it was back back just, through the low opening the in the engine room I near the fire. The bomb was where did you leave the casualty? We got it through the. We got it through the. Mr. Mulher, will you get this sorted out? Where is the casualty? So back through the low opening. Okay, back through the low opening. We went past the f fire, um, down to or up towards the stairs, uh, where we left it there at the bottom of the stairs. Leo doesn't think so. Hope you're right, lads. It's also training day for Zinder's firefighting and paramedic personnel. These are members of the military who've been relocated to work as lifesavers. It's not just the fire trucks and ambulance the Irish firefighters are donating, but also their expertise. And this trip was pointed towards road traffic collision and coding equipment and medical training as well. So they were the two aspects of training we were doing on this trip. Over the course of the next few days, the Irish firefighters provide instruction on all of the basics of firefighting and medical care. Head back, press down on the mask. You have to get a seal. Press down, press down. Push the down. Seat down. Okay. 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 Centre. Make sure it's centre, yeah? Okay. Make sure someone gets the centre. Make sure someone else gets the longboard. Someone is doing the collar. Someone is on the spine. Included in the donation are a large supply of hydraulic cutting devices. The locals are shown how to get to grip with the machinery that will help them deal with road traffic accidents and free casualties from vehicles. And they're proving to be keen students. They're really hungry for education. They'd keep you there till nine or 10 o'clock every night just to keep the training going. And they're like sponges. They just want to learn and learn and learn. Um, and it was brilliant to see them taking this on board and practicing and using the equipment, you know. Right, we're just, gonna, we're just back in here today. So we're going to get them to start with all the equipment. 
um, break it up into sets and try and get it out to the different stations around the area to different clients. Everywhere the Irish Brigade travel, they're accompanied by military protection. Here in Zinder, paramedic equipment is at a very basic level. This donation will go a long way. Just the fire appliance now, the same, again, it's the same as the previous station we were in. Just a jeep with a water tank, a small little pump on it, one length of hose, and it's your stretcher as well, so it acts as an ambulance as well. That's really basic. The journey is not all about work. The firefighters take time out from teaching to visit a local school and give some simple gifts to the children. We just said we would go and visit the schools in the, in the towns and, and make our presence felt. It was great to see their, their faces when they, you know, they get something. And they had their own in-house best pupil awards and they got bears of soap was the gift that they got in the class for the being the best pupil. That's how, how hard it is to get any sort of merchandise over there. You know, you see the smiles on them. A simple little gift means so much to them over there. Yeah, we've just pulled in along one of the roads, gone back into Zinder here. Um, the chaps have brought across, brought along a couple of bicycles. As you can see there, they're just taking them out of the truck. So they're literally just a surprise for a couple of kids up in this village. We're just going to give them the two bicycles. It's like when, when you were, you know, whatever, three or four years of age and Santa Claus was coming, this is ten times over to these. They really have nothing over there. Used toys, you know, anything like that, bicycles, um, huge thing for children over there. Roger that. Team Alpha found a casualty, 170 bar, withdrawing from risk area. Team Charlie are going to have to go in just in case they get into trouble, OK? We've got to get them in quickly. Let's get a move on there. Oh, right, Team Charlie, let's go. Back at the O'Brien Institute in Dublin, the recruits are struggling with the heat. Their task is to work together to find and remove life-size dummies and report back with their findings. But deep down in those sweltering halls, their brains aren't functioning at 100%. It's all about trying to memorise how many steps you went down, what turns you took, where you found a casualty, or if you had to leave a casualty, you can be confused and tired, you know, because you're, you're, you're literally, you're exhausted, you're dehydrated, you're, you're born and up like, and um, they're roaring and shouting at you to try and get information. Like, you might have only went into one room or two rooms. To actually give that back when they're shouting at you and screaming, and you're knackered, is, is unbelievably hard sometimes, you know? There's not one person we would have made a total balls of it at some stage. Talk to us when you come out. Go down over there for a minute. Go over there. Lads, off the ECO. We need the information now. You're searching on the right? Yeah. Go all the way around. Came against it. Turn your low opener. Yeah. Went through low Went straight through the opening. Turn right. And the casualty was just at the end of the low opening. So we brought it out just before the second stairs. On the left hand side, it's just under the stairs. Under the stairs. Sorry, I missed the end of Where's the casualty? The crew that have just come out at the moment, they would have had a longer run than the previous crews. The teams that are searching on the right, the area of greatest heat is the middle floor of, of this setup that we have here. So by virtue of the fact that they're spending more time in the area of greatest heat, they're finding it the most difficult. The reality is, because they haven't gone through anything like this before, they think that this is incredibly difficult. The temperatures down there are roughly 150 degrees. The reality is, in two weeks' time, we're going to be in attack containers and they're going to be between five and 700 degrees. Savage. It's the heat. The heat, and then um, we made a good, made a good ground going in. We found a low open, got in, got a casually. The problem is so many teams coming in, pushing your pin in the back as you're trying to exit with the casualty. So you're getting pinned in, trying to get out. But it's just, it's unreal. It just zaps you. There were certain days that you just thought, oh God. You know, I just got an awful pain, like, you know. There'd be stages you'd be just trying to dig deep to kind of go, you can do this, you know, and let's keep pushing. Like, there's a million guys that want to take your place. I don't take it for granted one second of the day, like, you know, so um, it was an incentive to keep going. 
team Foxtrot. I want them to go in on the right and get me that casualty. It's on the tween deck. Let's go, let's go. Come on, get a bit of speed on this. Okay. I'm constantly pushing it. Like you're doing, you're doing six months of high end stuff, intensity all the time. But all the guys that are in my class, there's always a day or two you'd look at the guy and he's, you know he was trained. What's the time of whistle? When did you? Time of whistle. What time? What time is you out? What time of whistle? 16:01. What's the time now? 16:06. 16:06. So they're only five minutes past the time of whistle. So they're dead. Okay. You can tell the parents. It definitely helps having a group of people that you get on with because if you were having a bad day, a lot of the time you find out that they're either feeling the exact same as you or they already have, so it kind of makes it a little bit easier then. By the right-hand side of the opening, we found another casualty, unable to carry it. It was too heavy. So we informed yourself that we need to get a crew there as soon as possible. There were days where you'd be so physically and mentally exhausted that you would start to question why you're doing this. Is it worth it? Hard work, yeah. It's only, it's only half done as well. We've to charge back up our sets again. New cylinders on. Fresh supply, we're going back in again. Before I joined, I often heard the term, well, you have two families now, your own family and the fire brigade family. When you feel like you just can't study anymore, you've done as much as you can, or you can't roll that extra length of hose anymore, you, every part of your body is aching, they will gather around you and they'll pick you up and they'll bring you through it. This is the ambulance we're replacing here tomorrow. We're handing over we're handing over the new ambulance tomorrow. So it's really just a stretcher <laughs> in the back of a Jeep <laughs> with no back window. So we have a big step forward. The King of Zinder and some prominent elders from the area gather for a ceremony to celebrate the Irish firefighters. It's been an incredible journey. Before their arrival, this area had next to no resources for dealing with emergency situations. You really feel as if you've done something. I know it's only a small thing we do. It's two weeks out of your life, really, but it really is rewarding. You've educated them in some sort of life-saving, either equipment or medical procedure. Even if that eases the suffering for one or two people a year from being extricated from a vehicle, I mean, that's, that's well worth our trip then. Across continents and thousands of kilometers of desert, these men have forged a bond with their new recruits. It's a long road to Zinder, but the memories they bring home will last a lifetime. It was a really arduous task, but extremely rewarding. We've helped people, basically. That's what we get out of it at the end of the day. That's the buzz we get out of it.